Welcome to the stage, Cynthia Marshall. No. All right, get up and clap with me. Get up. Come on, set your lunch. Get up. Come on, get up. Yeah, we got some music on. Get up. Okay, I think we know ain't no mountain high enough. Come on now, let me hear you. Come on now. Ain't no river. Now point to somebody. To keep me from getting to you. All right, sit down. Woo! All right. How's everybody doing? Welcome to Dallas to Talent Connect 2019. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. I am so glad to be here. Now, that's my theme song, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. And the reason that is my theme song, and you'll find out later, that I've had a few mountains to climb. Anybody here climbed a few mountains? But as long as we have each other, as long as we are here together, there ain't no mountain high enough to keep me from getting to you. So we came to have a little fun, is that okay? All right, and we came to talk to the HR people. Any HR people out there? I'm an HR person. And as you can see, we're gonna talk today about leading from the heart. Look at somebody and say, leading from the heart. Okay, so let me tell you, I got a few ground rules, okay? Y'all gotta get with me. And I know it's right after lunch, is it right after lunch? Okay, here are the ground rules. I have three ground rules. The first one is that you have to talk to each other. So look at your neighbor. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Don't get nervous. We're going to get out before midnight. Okay? But I need you to just look at your neighbor and just say, neighbor, I'm glad to see you. I'm so glad you made it to Dallas. Talk to them. Talk to them. Okay. My second ground rule. Now see that you get to know somebody. Did you get to know somebody? Okay, my second ground rule is that you have to talk back to me. So every now and then I need some noise. I need an amen. Can I get a witness, sister, something, okay? I like a little noise, okay? I'm the mother of four, so I like a little noise. And then the last ground rule, you know how they tell you to turn your phones off? I worked for AT&T for 36 years, so if you have a phone, you can turn it on, you can tweet, you can take pictures, you can talk, you can do whatever you want to do because that's my pension, okay? <laughs> there is something, there is something about that phone that I love. Okay, so let's get into it. I had a chance to, I, I'm serious, take the phones out. There's, I need somebody's phone to ring. It's just, that just does something to me, okay? It does something to me. Okay, so look. We only got 37 minutes left. We got a lot to talk about. And so what I want to talk about is leading from the heart. Leading with intention. Leading with insight. Leading with inclusion. Leading with inspiration. What I call all in. Okay? And so look at somebody and say, neighbor. No, see, no, no, that doesn't sound like church to me. Neighbor. Neighbor. I am HR. And I'm all in. All in. I kind of like that. Give yourself a hand. I like that. I like that. Okay, so before we start talking about leading with intent, leading with inclusion, leading with insight, leading with inspiration, I actually want to just tell you a little bit about my story so you'll know why I'm so fired up all the time. And yes, some of you are already asking. I'm like this all the time, okay? <laughs> all the time. And so... You'll see a big thing there that says education matters, zip code doesn't. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about my story. Born in Birmingham, Alabama. Anybody here from Alabama? Ooh, Alabama, where are you? Stand up, Alabama! Yes, woo! So I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. If you know your civil rights history, there was a church, the 16th Street uh, Baptist Church that was bombed. There was another church uh, Baptist Church, uh, Reverend Shoulsworth Church, those were my mother's two churches. 
And so four girls lost their lives in 1963 uh, in a bombing. There's not a day goes by where I don't think about those four girls and the fact that they sacrificed and they lost their lives so that my mother's four girls and her two sons could have the freedom and enjoy what we enjoy today. So my parents left Birmingham, Alabama three, months, three years prior to that incident when I was three months old. And they left Birmingham so, because they didn't want their kids to grow up in the Jim Crow South. And so we went to the San Francisco Bay Area. Any Californians in the house? All right, stand up, Californians. I got to give you your moment of fame, too. All right. So I grew up in a place called Richmond, California. Some people think, Rich, uh, please don't tell me Richmond, California is in the house. Some people always think Richmond, Virginia, but it, Richmond back there, yes. So I grew up in the Easter Hill Public Housing Projects in Richmond, California. When I was 11 years old, I saw my father shoot a man in the head in self-defense. And actually, it was more in defense of me since all this commotion broke out in our house and my mother took all of her six kids and told us to go into the back room. Now, I know you find this hard to believe, but I was actually a very quiet kid. I know, I know. You can say, neighbor, I don't believe that, okay? I was actually a very quiet kid, and so I would just sit in my math books and just look around. But that particular day, I was nosy, and I wanted to see what was going on at the front door and see why my mother shoved all of us into the back room. So I went to the front door, and that's when my father realized that I was no longer in the back room with my five brothers and sisters, but in the potential pathway of a bullet. A 17-year-old young man pointed a pistol down to my father's right side to me. That's when my father shot back in self-defense. Uh, it wasn't fatal, thank goodness, but you can well imagine the chaos that broke out in our house. So as a result of that incident, we were sequestered in the house for safety purposes, meaning we couldn't go to school. But I cried, cried, cried in the seventh grade at 11 years old because I wanted to go to school. Because I was taught at a very early age that education was our ticket out of whatever it was. What I found out later is that it was poverty but education was our ticket out. My mother put two books in my hand. She put a math book in one hand and a Bible in the other and said, if I just kept my head in these two books, I would get out. So we're locked in the house. We can't get out. But my mother figured out a way for me to get to school. She had a uniformed police officer take me to school in the seventh grade. He'd sometimes show up in his police uniform and put me in his car and take me to school, or sometime he would ride the bus with me. So when I got this job I'm in now and they gave me detail and tried to tell me to get used to it, I said, I've had Secret Service since I was 11 years old, okay? <laughs> I got this, okay? And so fast forward four years later, my parents divorced, 15 years old. I'm gonna be a junior in high school, going to be head cheerleader. We had to flee our house that summer for safety purposes. My mother's prayer was that we would make it back home before school started because of course education was everything to her. We made it back home, and my father had taken everything out of a big four-bedroom deluxe unit uh, in the projects. And all we had was a mattress for me and my younger sister to sleep on. Now, I ran track. I was sent to sprint growing up, okay? And so all of our trophies were missing, all of that, but my mother just said all she wanted was peace of mind, that God would provide. And I went back to school with a brace on my nose, head cheerleader, and I stood out there and I cheered like nothing was wrong. Fortunately for me, three teachers and a principal embraced me, saw what was going on, embraced my mom. In fact, do we have any educators or former educators in the house? Stand up, stand up, stand up. I have to give you your props. I believe you are Homeland Security. You're the ones really securing the future. Three educators and a principal literally saved my life, along, of course, uh, with the police officers, which I always give them the credit that they deserve, too, because they truly are here to protect and to serve. So let's give it up for our law enforcement. So fortunately for me, I ended up having the village come around me, and I got five full scholarships to the college of my choice and chose the University of California at Berkeley. Go Bears! I hope there are no Ole Miss people in the house because we beat Ole Miss last Saturday. It was so good. It was so good. 
we're undefeated right now, and we can't always say that. And so my first week in college, I showed up on the campus, and it was just big. Sailor Gate was there, the Campanile was there, it was just big. And that's what I knew, that I had to be big. My first week in college, my boyfriend, who was three hours away in Fresno, California, called me. He was a year ahead of me. Is Fresno in the house? He told me that he, uh, he had a surprise for me. He said, I changed schools. I'm right across the bridge. I'm at San Francisco State University now, so I can be close to you. I said, hold on, boyfriend. <laughs> hold on, boyfriend. I got a surprise for you. I said, I will call you the day I graduate. This is my first week in college. <laughs> because... I was taught four words growing up, dream, focus, pray, and act. And this was the focus part. And I said, I'll call you the day I graduate. So I did my thing at Berkeley, first African-American cheerleader. I'm in a sorority, I'm doing my thing. I graduate at two o'clock and I called him at three o'clock. <laughs> and he tried to act like he didn't know who I was. <laughs> and I told him I was fired up. I said, I just graduated, I'm gonna start work for the phone company, I'm so fired up. He said, who is this? He said, I haven't talked to you in almost four years. I said, my mom's having me a party at six o'clock. She's still living in Easter Hill, but I'm gonna help her get out. My mother was working three jobs. I was fired up about my job. I had a recruiter. We got any recruiters in the house? I had that recruiter on campus just telling me about these great jobs and just what a great opportunity I had. And literally that recruiter helped me make a good decision that saved me. It was beautiful. So I told him, I'm going to start working at the phone company. Oh, I was just wild. And he said, I said, my mother's having a party at six o'clock. You got to come to the party. Our lives are getting ready to change. He said, I can't come to the party. I'm engaged. <laughs> I said, okay, boyfriend, that's the wrong answer though. Because I kept my end of the bargain. I told you I was going to call you when I graduated. I said, I just graduated at two o'clock. It's three o'clock. I mean, dude, it's an hour. <laughs> and so he said, he was engaged, he couldn't come to the party. Uh, so fortunately, you see him in that picture right there in one of our little DECA pictures. Uh, what Beyonce said, if you like it, then you ought to put a ring on it. He came to the party and I've been married to him 36 years. Yes! I tell him, I tell him all the time he was that close to missing his blessing. So, that's who I am. I started working for at and I had a fabulous, fabulous 36 year a career, and then I retired in May of 2017. And again, I had a fabulous career. Uh, thank goodness for the HR people who just helped me navigate a wonderful career. 14 different jobs, eight different departments, uh, three different states, California, North Carolina, and then Texas. And then I retired. And I actually came here to help AT&T with the cultural transformation. We did that for five years. And so then I retired, started my own consulting company, helped the Dow Chemical Company get going with their cultural transformation. And then on February the 21st, 2018, I got a call. And it was actually the day Billy Graham had passed away and we had these teenagers in Parkland, Florida advocating for their rights. And it was a day that just struck me and I was sitting writing a blog, I had just finished a blog called Impact. And I looked at the impact of these teenagers on the one hand, and this 99-year-old Billy Graham who had just passed away, and the impact that they were having on my life and that he had on my life. And I found myself somewhere down the middle thinking about what's the impact that I'm going to have. Well, later that day, I'm on the phone with my client, and my phone is blowing up, my tech, you know, cell phone just blowing up. I thought it was one of my four kids. I handed it to my husband, and I said, just transfer the money because... <laughs> Because I had just gotten to a point where I'm like, don't even give me all the extra stuff. Just, you know, just give me an amount and we'll just transfer it. I'm busy, you're busy. Okay, so <laughs> anybody in here with kids, you know what I'm talking about, especially teenagers in college, all that. You don't even have to explain. Just tell me, just put 320 on there or 750, I got it. So I told my husband, just transfer the money. Some, the kids are blowing up the phone. And he came back and he said, you need to get off that phone. He said, uh, Mark Cuban is trying to reach you. I said, who is that? <laughs> because believe it or not, I didn't know Mark Cuban. And you know what? You're raising four kids. You got job. You got stuff going on. Soccer mom. I ain't got time to watch TV. He said Shark Tank. I'm like, mm, never seen Shark Tank. But I can tell you now, I have seen Shark Tank since then. I know all about it. And so 
I ended up talking to Mark. He asked me if I could come and see him. And I told him, actually, I was having a mammogram that day at 2 o'clock. And I told him I learned the hard way. I learned the hard way what happens when you don't keep your doctor's appointments. And so I ended up going to see him, and the rest is history. Uh, he asked me if I would come in and help him transform the culture of the Dallas Mavericks. And what I did, what I think I brought in, was intent, insight, inclusion, and hopefully a little inspiration. His request was to transform the culture. So we started out with the 100-day plan, and it's famous now, so you get a picture of it. I literally wrote this on an airplane. I literally wrote it on an airplane, and I, let me tell you what I did. I drew from everything I knew, honestly, as an HR leader. When I led HR for my team at AT&T, our hashtag was HR, we run this place. Look at somebody and said, hashtag HR. Hashtag HR. We run this place. <laughs> and I really felt that. I mean, we ran the place, okay? We were the heart of the organization. So I drew from everything I knew to put this 100-day plan together. And it's center centered around modeling zero tolerance, letting people know we have absolutely zero tolerance for inappropriate behavior, workplace misconduct, period. We put a Mavs women's playbook together. Any women in the house? Any women in the house? We said we're gonna make a priority because of course when I walked in, there were 10 white men running the Dallas Mavericks. Nothing wrong with men, okay? But you know, as well as I know, if you're going to be successful and have great results, you've gotta have a diverse group of people around the table. So, my leadership team now, and Erin Feingold is here, she's a part of it, stand up Erin. My leadership team now is 50% women and 47% people of color. And we just got a public performance review last week, so I think we're doing a pretty good job. So that is what we focused on. It's all right there. Go to the next slide, Erin. Our vision was that by 2019, so this was in 2018, we would be the standard, the global standard for diversity and inclusion in the NBA. And in fact, I think I have some NBA friends in the house. Somewhere, NBA friends, stand up. Stand up, my NBA friends. And any Dallas Mavericks in the house, stand up. Let's give it up for them. Let's give it up for them. And where, wait a minute, where's Paloma? Paloma from Pittsburgh, who inspired me. We were hanging out, doing our makeup and stuff. Hey, Paloma, let's give it up for Paloma. Okay. So here's our playbook. Here's our playbook. We said we have to make the new values clear. We came in and our values, and I'll talk about them in a minute, perfect our crafts. We have to own our mistakes, ask for help, create supportive communities. We put together four employee resource groups, and then we invested in our people. This is how we have played for the last year and a half. Next slide. So I told you our short-term vision. These are our values. Character, respect, authenticity, fairness, and teamwork. We told our team they're not just going to be on the walls, but they will operate in the halls. All of our decisions are based off this. The example I gave them about character, I will give it to you. Uh, my son, who is 27 years old now, uh, is adopted. And we adopted him at two and a half years old. When he was about three and a half years old, you know, we had him in preschool, and they had a baby picture contest. And so you can imagine, we don't have any baby pictures of my son. We adopted him at two and a half years old. And so I came in one day and my husband was practicing for the baby picture contest and practicing the speech and he had a picture of a baby. It was my nephew. <laughs> it wasn't our son. And so I told him, I said, well, you can't do that. I mean, that's dishonest. He said, no, 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 no. My job is to give him self-esteem, confidence. And so they had this whole story made up about this picture that was supposed to be my son. It wasn't even like the same color, the same complexion. I don't know how they thought they were gonna pull this off. And so you know how you try, not, any married people in here, you know how you try not to argue in front of the kids? And so I just gave him some of that head action, rolled my eyes a little bit, like you can't do this. So the bottom line is I go to work the next day and guess what? The boy took that picture and that story to school. I came in the next, I came in that evening, the trophy from the baby picture contest was literally on my kitchen table. <laughs> so I'm just sick. My husband is reared back, he's smiling. I'm talking about character. He said, my job is to give him self-esteem. Look at him, look at the boy, he won the contest. And he goes, mommy, mommy. He says, let me tell you what happened. And I'm just sick about the whole thing. I said, what happened? 
he said, my son's name is Anthony, okay? He said, I held up the picture and I said, hi, everybody, this is my cousin Jalen. He said, I told him this is my cousin Jalen because I don't have any baby pictures because I was born in the bathtub and then my mom got arrested when I was nine months old with my nine-year-old brother taking care of me and we were abandoned. I was abused and I was in all these foster homes and then I got adopted. He said, mommy, I told him the whole story. Everybody started crying and they just gave me the trophy. <laughs> here's, what I, here's what I love about that. Here's what I love about it. At three and a half years old, with his parents' permission to lie, because I didn't completely shut it down, okay? With his parents' permission to lie, he showed character. And he showed it because it's in us early. And we just need to make sure it comes out, no matter what the circumstances are and no matter what other people say is okay to do. Respect is a big thing for us. Authenticity, we tell people to do you. You can imagine I'm doing me when I walk in the door every day. Fairness is something we focus on a lot. Gender pay equity was a big thing for us. So here's a video I want to share with you that I show with my team, to my team after I asked for all of the pay of all of the people in there and found a little bit of an issue. Enjoy this video. If I was Prime Minister, I would make it illegal. It is the wrong time. Uh -huh. Why does he get five dollars? That's just the way it is. <laughs> Seven dollars. It should be flat out illegal, like, I'm not joking, I'm not being unreasonable. Women and men should have the same money. They should have 50-50, 60-60, if you want to do 120. It should just be how hard you work. If you do the same work, you should get paid the same money. What we're trying to tell you is that it's not fair that boys get paid more than girls. Maybe if the men noticed they were being paid more than the women, they should speak up about it. When I am older, I'm going to make a change, if I don't forget. Ugh. Ugh, I have no words, it's so wrong. We do not have a gender pay equity, equity issue at the Dallas Mavericks. The women are in high paying positions and they get the same pay as men in their similar positions. Teamwork was another thing we focused on. I learned a lesson about teamwork a long time ago. The lesson I learned in literally in college, no man is an island, no man stands alone. Each man's joy is joy to me. Each man's grief is my own. We need one another, so I will defend each man as my brother, each man as my friend. That's what we are about at the Dallas Mavericks teamwork. And then we are leading with inclusion. We are about diversity and inclusion. So I want to just teach a little lesson real quick. Are you up for a quick lesson? All right, stand up. I'm going to teach you a quick lesson. I like to describe it as diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Diversity, and you know this, it's about the mix, it's about representation, it's about a lot of things you can see and some things you can't see. And of course, we could get 50% women at the table, we could get 47% people of color at the table, we can have everybody. But inclusion, as you well know, because you live this every day, is about how you make people feel. Have you taught them the rules? Have you taught them how, the dance steps? Do they know what to do? Yes, you've invited them to the party, but have you taught them how to dance? How many of you consider yourselves to be good singers? How many, of your, how many of you consider yourselves to be good dancers? Okay, let's do a test here. We're gonna, we're gonna learn a little lesson. This is about teaching people to dance. You're all in the room, but some of you may not know the rules or how to dance. That's inclusion, so we're going to teach it. Who knows how to do the Cupid Shuffle? How many of you know how to do the Cupid Shuffle? Okay, we are gonna freak the production people out. A few of you, come up, up here if you know how to do the Cupid Shuffle. Come on up here. Right here. Right here. 
We're going to see if you know how to do it. Come on. All right. Let's do it. Come on. Come up. Come up. Come up. Okay, give me the music. Okay. We're going to teach y'all how to dance. I think we got enough now. The rest of y'all just dance out there. Turn around. Stay down there. All right, right here. Okay, we're going to teach y'all how to do this. All right, give me the music. This is about teaching each other the rules and teaching each other how to dance. Come on, to the right. Come on, to the left. Four times. All right. Kick, 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 turn. Do they have it? Okay, to the left. Okay, are you learning it? Kick, 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 kick. Turn. Come on. Are y'all getting it? Kick. Everybody. To the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the left, to the left, to the left, to the left. Now kick, now kick. All right. All right, that's it. Y'all did 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 it. Go. Y'all did it. Y'all did it. Y'all did it. Yes. 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 Okay. Let's give it up for all our volunteers. The point to that is, it's just not enough to invite people to the party. We have to teach people how to dance. And that's what we are trying to do at the Dallas Mavericks. We are trying to create a culture of diversity and inclusion. So what's the next one? We're leading with inclusion, but we're also leading with insight. How many of you see a six? How many of you see a nine? How many of you see both? I love that caption. It says, just because you are right does not mean I am wrong. You just have seen light from a different side. Next slide. We're going to go past that one in the interest of time. I love this one because we're trying to focus on equality and equity. I'm going to give you literally, literally a minute to just talk to a neighbor and talk about the difference in those three images right there. Go with the neighbor, what's different? What do you see? What do you see? Okay, I think we have, uh, we have some mic runners out there. Mic runners, okay. Who wants to explain what's the difference? What's happening in that middle slide? I'll tell you, of course, the difference in the first slide. E equality and equity. The first slide, of course, the first image, we gave everybody the same thing on the left side of that picture. We gave everybody a box to stand on to see over the fence, even though it was not exactly what they needed. Equity is we give people what they need based on their starting point. Who can tell me what's happening in that middle image? Okay, I see a person right over here. Stand up, you raise your hand. Right over here. Yes, you. What's your name? Malika. Malika? Ooh, that's pretty. Let's give it up for Malika. <laughs> Malika, tell us what is happening in that middle image. What do your HRIs see? Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> so what I see here is that um, they're lifting the other person up, that people need to leave pe lift people up on their team 
and make sure that they all have the same opportunity to have the same experience, well, as close as they can. Absolutely, and you lift them up based on what they need. So if one person needs a box, great. If one person needs no box, if one person needs two boxes, or the person has a unique ability and they need something special, they might need a ramp, you give them that. So what's the difference in that last image? Who sees a difference in that last image? They're going over to somebody. I'll tell you what it is. That last image, look what's happening on the end. There we go. Okay, somebody wants to tell us. I was getting ready to tell it. I was going to spill it. Hi, everyone. Actually, on the third image, they have removed the obstacle. They have just changed the landscape to make it uh, similar to everyone. Let's give it up for her. She said they removed the obstacle. <laughs> and that's what we as HR people get to do. We get to remove obstacles. So we focused a lot on inclusion. We were very intentional, of course. We had different perspectives, so we led with insight. Obviously, we're leading with inclusion, but then we're also leading with inspiration. These are the things that inspire me. These are the values. I call them my two cents. And of course, I'm cents, so I call them my two cents, OK? Family is important to me. And I like to talk about knowing your crystal balls from your rubber balls. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Crystal balls are things in your life that shatter. You drop them, they shatter, they never come back. And I'm trying my best not to drop this because we'd have a little problem here. So what are those things in your life that if you drop them, they would never come back? Rubber balls are the things in your life they bounce back. There you go. They bounce back. You can catch those because you could actually throw that back to me. I had one of those moments when I was, and I'll tell you my cancer story in a minute, but I had one of those moments when I was invited to help our company out. And I was there all week in Washington, D.C., and I told them the only time I couldn't help them was on Wednesday afternoon. I couldn't meet with policymakers on Wednesday afternoon because that was my son's first high school swim meet. It wasn't his second high school swim meet, it was his first. And so when I got to Washington, D.C. and I got the schedule, guess who they wanted me to meet with on Wednesday afternoon? The most important policymakers. What do you think I did? I couldn't do it. When, I, when my son looked up at that high school swim meet, guess who he saw? He won that individual medley race because his mama was in the stands. He saw his mama there. And what I had told them is that it is, a, it is a crystal ball to me. My family is crystal. Go to the next slide. Those are all my children. They inspire me. They're all adopted. That boy in the middle. <laughs> that boy in the middle is the one who I told the story about uh, with the baby picture contest. And he picked both of his sisters off television. One was a Wednesday's child in San Francisco, and one was a Friday's child in North Carolina. In fact, when we moved him to school, to college, I said, give me the remote control. <laughs> I got the Wednesday's kid, the Friday's kid. It's five more days of the week. After four second trimester miscarriages and a daughter who died at six months old, the Lord had a way to make our family. And so that young man right there also had a brother who was nine years old, when he was abandoned at nine months old. So go to the next slide. So we ended up finding him, and so you'll see Ricky there on the picture as well. I am blessed to be the queen of the castle of these four people. I have a Mother's Day bell that I literally ring. This is to all the mothers. They gave me this bell. They hate they gave me this bell, okay? I have a Mother's Day bell that I ring every Mother's Day, literally from when the clock strikes midnight <laughs> until 11.59 the next day. And they're all grown now. I even call their houses and I just like ring <laughs> the bell. And so we brought a few bells for some of the mothers. And then of course, I have my tiara that I wear that my work team actually gave me because they believe in HR, we run the place, and not only am I the queen of the castle at home, 
but I was the queen of the castle at work because of the kind of work we were doing. Go to the next slide. Something else that is crystal to me, and I'll leave with you with this because I hope it becomes crystal to you. Look at somebody, and you're all HR people, so you are going to just, I don't know what you're going to do when I tell you to do this. Look at somebody and say, neighbor. neighbor. Say it loud, neighbor. neighbor. Do you have PMS? <laughs> now, I have no idea. I have no idea why you are laughing. Because there is no way a former senior vice president of human resources is going to ask you about what you're thinking about. I'm talking about physical, mental, and spiritual health. I was actually blessed because of an HR team that had some insight. Insight to do something called corporate athlete and to make us focus on our physical, mental, and spiritual health. They gave us an accountability buddy and we had to pick one thing that we would do to really focus on our health. And my one thing was to finally go home and take a slip of paper that a doctor had given me a month before my 50th birthday and to finally have a colonoscopy. Technically, I was in compliance because I got it done on my last day of 50. And on my 51st birthday, I got a call telling me to get to a surgeon. Because of an HR team focused on our health and leading a corporate athlete session, I ended up being diagnosed, and fortunately, we found it. But it was stage three colon cancer, one lymph node away from stage four. And I had had it for a while. But finally, because of the corporate athlete session, I actually went and took care of my health business. A team rallied around me like you wouldn't believe. It was brutal, but thank goodness I stand here right now before you, cancer-free after eight years. Yes. I had to tell that story to the HR team because it was an HR initiative that led that. We care about people. We truly do run the place. I want, I want everybody to stand up. Everybody stand up. OK, do I have uh, some music teed up? Because we went right past Ain't No Mountain High Enough. I got the music teed up because I got three minutes to go, OK? We are HR people. We are leaders. We are the pulse of the company. Go to the last slide. We are the most vital part of the organization. We lead a company with intent. We lead a company with insight. We lead organizations with inclusion. We actually inspire organizations. Ain't no mountain too high enough for us to reach each other, for us to reach our colleagues, for us to do what we need to do in people's lives. So I need you to find five people as I'm wrapping up and tell them ain't no mountain high enough. We are HR and we run this place. God bless you.